Well, welcome to Legacy Week 2. It's great to have you with us. Uh, Legacy is our time of the year that we just spend some time. For us, it used to be in the month of September. We've moved that this year to the month of June, where we look at our future because as a church, we want to create a generational echo. Legacy is really us about us seeding tomorrow, today. It's about our future. It's about what we do today is going to have a bearing on our future. In actual fact, if you said to me, where am I going to, where do you think I'll be 20 years from now? I would only have to look at your patterns and your behaviours and your habits of today. And that will give me a fair indication of where you are going to head in life. I know there are some things that are unexplainable. There are certain things that happen out of the blue. But generally, If we're all around 20 years from now, we will really be the conglomeration of the decisions that we made today. That's really how it's going to go down at the end of time. Amen. Are are you with me? You know, I I know that's to be true for our family. Uh, I think about the the children when they're growing up. You know, you think about how how they're going to turn out. Well, really, how how we raise them today is going to determine how they turn out tomorrow. What we do today has an incredible bearing on our future. That is true of our church. That is true of ourselves. That is true of our families. And so legacy is really an opportunity for us to think about and reflect, where do we want to be 20 years from now as a church? Where do we want to be 30 years from now as a church? Paul de Jong says this, In every God-breathed vision, there is a strategic season where our response determines what our tomorrow will look like. I'll say that again one more time. In every God-breathed vision, there is a strategic season where our response determines what our tomorrow will look like. You know, you can't talk about your future without thinking about and taking time to pray and fast. And that's why this week as a church, we took out three days, Tuesday, Wednesday and Thursday, to pray about our future and also to fast. Praying helps us to connect with God. Fasting helps us to disconnect with the world. And I want to tell you, I've been praying for a long time. In actual fact, this church was birthed out of a prayer meeting. I believe in prayer with all of my heart and I believe in fasting. I didn't say I enjoy fasting. I said I believe in fasting. Is there anyone else out there who could agree with that? You have never heard me say I I love fasting, but I do believe in it. I do believe in the discipline and the power of prayer and fasting. And I want to say this last three days of praying and fasting has been up there with some of the most special times I've ever had in seeking God's face. And God gave me a number of downloads. Uh, This thought came out of that time that I'm about to share with you, came out of that prayer and fasting time in speaking to people I know that there were things that God was saying to them which is amazing but on the Thursday night I really felt God give those that were in the room a a, a real word particularly those that were going through a struggle those who were going through a tough time but as I reflected upon it I I believe this word it wasn't just for those in that room indeed it was for all of those who are doing a tough right now and it's for all of those in Victory Church. And and the word was real simple. It says, the struggle that you are presently facing will not break you, but instead it will lead to your breakthrough. And I really believe that with all of my heart. The thing that you're facing right now will not break you. It won't break you, but it will lead to your breakthrough. So to you, I want to say, do not give up. Don't you dare give up. Don't you give up. Don't you give in. Hold your line. Don't give up. Don't give in. Hold your line. Don't give up. Don't give in. Because what you are facing right now will not break you, but it will lead to your breakthrough. So don't give up. Don't give in, but hold your line. And I believe with all of my heart that what you're facing will lead to a breakthrough. And you're going to look back and you'll see the goodness of God. And you'll be able to have one of those moments that, wow, I wouldn't say I enjoyed that season, but I'm glad God took me through it because I'm bigger and better for it. So if that is you, if that's you, don't give up. Don't give in, but hold your line because I believe it's going to lead to an incredible breakthrough for you, and we want to stand with each and every one of you. Amen? Amen. Fantastic. Which leads to the message that I want to share with you today. And the subtitle is simply this, The Power of All. Shout out at me together, All, all 
all. And I want to turn to the book of Acts, chapter 4, verse 32. The book of Acts is all about the things that the early church did and experienced under this incredible uh, renewal of the uh, birth, sorry, of the church and the infilling of the Holy Spirit. It says this, all the believers were in one heart and mind. No one claimed that any of his possessions were his own, but they shared everything they had. With great power, the apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ and much grace was upon them all. There were no needy persons among them for from time to time, those who owned lands or houses sold them. They bought the money from the sales and put it at the apostles' feet and it was distributed to anyone as he had need. Joseph, a Levite from Cyprus, whom the apostles called Barnabas, which simply means sons of encouragement, sold a field he owned and bought the money and put it at the apostles' feet. I believe this with all of my heart that Scripture, all of Scripture is God-breathed and it is there for a purpose. It's there for our learning and growing in the things of God. And uh, this particular account that we're looking at today uh, really stuck out to me as we were praying and fasting. And uh, I wanna just draw from some of the revelation I received from it recently. And I think it's incredibly helpful for us as we're in our legacy season. It simply says this, it says, firstly, that when all the people, this is what stands out to me, it says, when all the people, which addresses the who, the Scriptures say all the believers. That, you've got to notice, it doesn't say some. Yeah. Yeah. Come on. It doesn't say some. And since I've had that revelation more recently, I've been doing a little bit of a study and uh, I have looked in the original language in the Greek and, and what this word all means. And you know what I came up with? All means all. In other words, it didn't mean just the leaders. I want, to, I want to smash some of the thinking out there. Oh, that's the leaders. They do that. No, 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 no. This is not, it didn't say the leaders. It didn't say the men. If you're a female here, let's not leave it to the men. And, and vice versa. Guys, it doesn't say the women. It's not for us to leave it to the ladies. And for those who are a little bit old, it doesn't say the youth of the church. I thank God for the youth of our church. They do so much. But let's not leave it to the young people. It doesn't say old people. It says all and all mean all. I think the early church was a powerful force and I have to ask myself, what made the early church so powerful? And I think we're hitting on something already today that all the people, which is the who. Second, it says, when all the people shared all that they had. This addresses the what. The early church all turned up all showed up and they all shared what they had. In other words, giving isn't just a financial thing. Giving includes finances, but it goes beyond finances. I sense that the early church shared their time. They shared their talents and they shared their treasures. See, we've been blessed to be a blessing. Our kids grew up with this mantra. You've been blessed by God to be a blessing to others. And I simply indoctrinated them with that mantra over and over and over again. They said that so many times as kids growing up because I didn't want our kids to be blessed and not know why they were blessed. All of us have been blessed in this room, but do you know why you've been blessed? If you don't, I'm here to tell you categorically, you've been blessed to be a blessing to others. And God gives us time. He gives us talents and He gives us treasures. We, we just heard this morning from our youth pastor, Dan, about some of the incredible year seven girls and what they've done to generate wealth and generate income. Because as a year seven girl, they don't have the opportunity to, to make too much money because they don't have a job, they're at school. And, and so they said, how can we contribute to the future and the ben benefit and blessing of others? And someone came up with a notion that we could wash cars and we could charge small cars $25 and larger cars $35. And they've been able to get a number of cars and people together and, and wash and make some money. And I just thank God for that. And all it took was just a little bit of time. 
just a little bit of effort on their part and there's money that they are able now to sow into the offering and to bless people. And so young people will be able to come to Winter Project who wouldn't have been able to go before because there were young people who just, just actually just gave their time. They shared their time. This isn't rocket science. And it's not only our time, it's our talents. You know, God has gifted each and every one of us to do great things. Just yesterday, had the privilege again of, of working with an incredible group of people with diverse giftings and, and uh, you're starting to see the, the beginnings of what was taking place with the cafe having a little bit of a revamp more recently. And uh, there were many people I'd love to give a shout out to, but there's one in particular I just want to mention. And it's this young man on the front row who was drumming this morning, by the way, uh, Macca, uh, as we call him, but his name's Thomas, his actual name is Thomas McCormack, but we call him affectionately Macca. He's 19 years of age. He's doing his apprenticeship as a builder and uh, he has certain skills now. And so for the last few Saturdays, including this Saturday coming, he's giving up his time and also using his talents in order to help with us revamp our cafe. And I sense that's something of what the early church did to make the early church so powerful. And Maka, I just want to commend you. Well done, mate. It's amazing. But, but the story gets better because what I know about Maka, he's not only giving of his time and his talents, but I know right now, he, he's been looking at this pledge card and he's been praying and asking God what it is that he could contribute financially toward the next 12 months. He's not just saying, well, I, I did enough. I've done my bit. You know, and, and, and you have, and I'm so grateful. And what you did again this morning on the drums, I'm so grateful, thank you. But the fact that you would say, you know what, but uh, I wanna give every area of my life, just like the early church, they shared every area of their lives. And so he's praying and thinking about, as am I, and I trust, as are you, how we might be able to financially contribute. God, speak to us, I pray, as to how we might be able to get involved when it comes to our offering. The early church were powerful because all of the people shared all they had. That's the who and the what. And thirdly, with all of their hearts. This addresses the how. You might say, what do you mean how? What's heart got to do with how? I would say heart's got everything to do with how. Everything starts with the heart. Write that down. Everything starts with the heart. And as a result, they were able then to place the offering at the apostles' feet because their heart was right. In other words, they had a high trust and a high love in God and the leadership of the church. And so they were able then to lay the finances at the apostles' feet. Everything starts with the heart. It came because they were able to see things as they were. You know, I believe with all of my heart that we're not going to truly give if our heart's not right. We're not going to get involved as, as I would desire people to get involved if our heart's not right. If we don't have a high love of God and a high trust in God, we're not going to give. Likewise, if, if we don't have a high love and a high trust of leadership, we're not going to give. Now, now, can I just say something that uh, is probably the most obvious thing I've ever said from this platform? And and no one is going to have any trouble believing what I'm about to say. And it's simply this. I am not a perfect leader. Yeah, there's no disagreement there. (laughs) And and the woman I married, she's not a perfect woman either. And, And our leadership team is not full of perfect people. We are not a perfect leadership team by any stretch of the imagination. But the issue when it comes to our heart, it's not about perfection. We don't not give because we're not perfect. It's it's, it's a question of love and trust. And I'd be the first to say that I'm not perfect. But I'd like to think that after 25 years of leading the same church, that there's a measure of trust. 25 years, no scandal. 25 years just just serving God in the same place should equal something. And and can I say, the context of this early church, when they laid the money at the uh, the apostles' feet, 
Those men were not perfect. I mean, at the head of that rabble was Peter. Peter was impulsive. This is the same guy who cut off ears. This is the same guy that denied Jesus, not once nor twice, but three times. This is the same Peter that, that did some crazy things. And not only, you know, while Jesus was with him, but even years later as a church leader, it was in Galatians that Paul had to address Peter because Peter had kind of grown a little bit weary and tired and was getting intimidated by the religious leaders and, and Paul had to give him a speaking to. This is the same guy. Peter is not perfect. But the emphasis of their giving was not based upon the perfection of the leaders, but there was a high level of trust and a, and a high level of love that flowed in that church. And as a result, they were able to lay the money at the disciples' feet. And I, I love that notion that they just laid at the disciples' feet for them to use at their discretion. Because this is what I know about leadership. Leadership has a perspective and an understanding and an insight that uh, other people don't have when it comes to where should the money go. Now, every parent understands this. Can you imagine as two parents getting your kids together and saying, hey, kids, just need to know dad's been out working, mum's been out working, and we've got all this money coming this week, and we just want to know what we should do with it. Can you imagine going to your kids and saying, hey kids, what should we do with these finances? I promise you this, it's going to go where they want it. Uh, you're not going to get little Johnny saying, Dad, we need, to put the we, we need to think of the mortgage. We do. And we better make sure those electricity bills are paid. They're not going to, no, I promise you. They are not thinking about that. I'll tell you what the conversation is going to look like. Depending on their age, if they're a little bit younger, they're going to say, Lego, we want Lego. McDonald's, <laughs> Hungry Jacks, whatever it is. And it will all be centred around what they want. Yeah. And, and, and I know as parents, you love your children, but you just can't afford to listen to that because actually um, it's just not going to go well for you. Because if you just give them all they want, pretty soon other areas that are as important, if not more important, are going to get neglected. And that's why God places leaders in every organisation, every family, every business and every church to have a healthy uh, perspective of what actually needs to be done with the finances. And I love the fact that they, they didn't come and say, I'll give as long as it goes into this area. They said, no, look, you know what? You're in, a, you're in a position we don't have, so we're going to give it to you and trust and pray that God will give you wisdom to know where to put those finances. When we're thinking about and talking about our Prime Minister next time, can you, can, instead of just getting caught up in the band at work, can, can you spare a thought of how difficult it must be to lead a nation? Yeah. I struggle leading my own family at times. To lead a nation, yeah. Yeah. to really help right now, would not be to add to the pain of the, nation, uh, the leader of our nation, but to be praying for him. You know, and that's why we pay taxes. You know, we don't pay taxes. Oh, I hope this money goes to the roads. We need better roads around here. And we do. But there's a whole heap of other needs that we know nothing about. Yeah, 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 yeah. And so we, we pay our taxes. And our responsibility is one, to pay our taxes. And two, to pray for our leader that God would give him yeah, wisdom to know how to spend good. those finances. And if for whatever reason those finances go in an area that isn't of your preference, we're just going to trust that actually maybe God has graced our leader to make sure those finances would be used in an area that he sees fit based upon the bigger picture. Are you with me? And so this early church, the model is this, all of the people shared all that they had with all of their heart. And guess what happened? All the needs were met. And that is addressing the purpose. The Bible says that this way, there was no needy among them. In other words, when everyone opens up their lives, their hearts and their wallets, all the needs were met. Do you, right, you know right now we could eradicate world poverty in one generation if the money just got into the right hands? The reason we have high world poverty is because the money is not getting to where it needs to go. And I believe why so many churches struggle is because the money is just not getting where it needs to go. And I'll be the first to say as a church we could be doing so much more 
in our ministries. We could be doing so much more in our communities. We could be doing so much more beyond our communities. We could. I really do believe that. But it's really going to become dependent upon who gets involved and how much as to whether the needs are met or not. In actual fact, a lot of our time as leaders is, is, is spending time praying and thinking about how we may best spend our money because we have more need than we have finance. Yeah. And that could be eradicated if we actually Good. engaged in God's pattern and God's way when it comes to giving. So this mention of all the people shared all that they had with all of their heart and surprise, surprise, all the needs were met. I mean, this is not rocket science. Why was the early church so powerful? I'll tell you why. Because all the people shared all they had with all of their heart and all the needs were met. I mean, this is not rocket science. For those of you who say, we need to get back to the book of Acts, there's a part of it that says, absolutely. We certainly do need to get back to the pattern that the early church embraced. And it was simply this, that all of the people shared all they had with all of their heart and all the needs were met. I tell you that, that, that we could do so much, many more things if all the people shared all that we had with all of our heart, all the needs were met. And not only was all this going on, but then the Bible mentions some. It says, there's this group of people, it says, some sold properties and laid the finances that they received from the property at the apostles' feet. That wasn't all, that was just some. And these were the early church financial leaders. These are the ones who have been graced in the area of giving. Do you know every one of us has been gifted and graced uniquely different. And these guys were the original church financial leaders. They were the early church kingdom builders because God graces us differently. Look at this in Romans chapter 12, verse, eight, uh, verse six. It says, we have different gifts according to the grace given to each of us. If your gift is prophesying, then prophesy in accordance with your faith. If it's serving, then serve. If it is teaching, then teach. If it is to encourage, then give encouragement. If it's giving, then give generously. If it's to lead, then do it diligently. If it's to show mercy, then do it cheerfully. Here's the question I have. If someone's gifted to serve, does that mean someone's not gifted so they don't have to? No, it's not saying that. All of us should serve, but there are some who are just gifted to serve. And so they'll always go over and above. Would that be fair to say? Let me explain it this way. Would it be fair to say that there are some that are called to lead worship? Would that be fair to say? Does that mean if we're not called to lead worship, we shouldn't worship? Should we just leave it to the worship leader to worship? We just stand there and watch? Wow. That happens a lot, doesn't it? No, no. All of us should be called to worship God. We are all called. It didn't say we're all gifted to sing, but we should all worship God. All of us should lift up and make a joyful noise to God. But there are some that are graced to lead worship. I promise you, this is a prayer of mine every day. God, would You grace me to lead worship? Would You grace me to sing? And every day He answers the same way, with the same word, no. So I said, okay, if I can't, if I can't be a leader in that area, I'm certainly gonna be a contributor in that area. And so every, every week, Sunday was you're going to see me down the front. I'm going to be in the praise pit and I'm going to be jumping up and down and lifting my hands with the young people because that's how you stay young, by the way. That's how you stay young. I love what Paul Scanlon said recently. He said, uh, people don't uh, stop playing because they grow old. They grow old because they stop playing. When I gave my life to Jesus, I was down the front worshipping God. And I vowed I'd always do that. I didn't want to be that back row bandit with all respect to the back row bandits out there. Uh, <laughs> Are you hearing me a heart this morning? And so it is when it comes to our giving. All of us should give. All of us should be generous. But God graces people to be leaders in that area. And I think this is an important point because with our legacy this year, moving into the second half of the year, we want to start a new group, one we've never really started before, and it's specifically designed for our financial leaders. And some of you might say, oh, that's showing favoritism. Don't you know what it says in James? I do know what it says in James. But I also know what it says in Romans that some are gifted and we want to create a pathway and a platform for that gift to come to the fore.
And I want, this is what I want to say categorically. If there was one person in this church that could finance everything we ever wanted to do, every, every dream, every vision God ever gave me, if one person could finance that, I would still preach everything I'm preaching to you today. And I would still preach what I preached last week. Because it's not just about provision, it's about obedience. See, this is what I know. Jesus Christ set me free. He set me free from the curse of law and sin and death. He set me free from me. I made a decision to follow Him. And when I stepped into a new life of Jesus, I stepped out of my old life into a new life with Christ. The old is gone and the new has come. Jesus Christ alone set me free. But do you know what keeps me free? The decisions I make. What keeps me free is the decisions I make. If I choose to make godly decisions, it's going to keep me free. If I choose to make decisions that suit me, I'm going to get back into bondage. And there are many Christians today that get set free by Jesus, but they live in bondage and they live in this one foot in the world and one foot in uh, in the church and and they feel dissatisfied because they know they're free theologically, but they don't feel free. Why? What sets you free? The decisions we make that are in keeping with God's Word. You'll never be truly free while you're disobeying what God says plainly in His Word. Hearing God's voice 101 is do what the written Word says first. If you want to know what God is saying, you want a prophetic voice, you want something uh, supernatural, that's great. But I would say, let it be off the foundation of doing what the Bible says. And so when it comes to giving, the Bible says to give. When it talks about tithing, it's in the Bible. And if you want to stay in freedom, then you've got to get on God's page and work with God's program. So if one person could finance everything we ever wanted to do in this church, I would still say, come on church, come on give. Because if you don't, you're going to live in bondage. We're not going to live in the freedom God intended us to live in. You know, I, I, Jesus forgave me. But every day I have to learn to forgive others. And if I don't, guess what? Jesus forgives me, but I'm going to live in bondage because I haven't forgiven others. My actions and your actions are what is going to keep us free or put us back into bondage. That's why we need to know what the Word of God says. That's why we read our Bible on a daily basis. One, to inform us of what God's ways are, but two, to remind us of what those ways are because we tend to forget. And so it's with our hearts and our minds that we seek His face in order to know His will so that we can be obedient to His Word, His will and His ways. Are you with me today? And so we're going we're gonna to talk more about that next week, about the launch of Kingdom Builders, which is a group for our financial leaders. Practically, what does this mean for us today? Well, I believe it comes back to our four steps to financial freedom, of which are found in Paul de Jong's book, God, Money, Me. And again, if you have not read this book, I would say read this book. If you have read this book, I would say read this book probably every 12 months. It's going to help hold you Uh, in good stead when it comes to you doing the right thing with your finances. Because just like the early church, all met together, shared all they had, uh, all had the same heart, and as a result, all the needs were met. That worked in the context of the church. But what about your life? Well, the same thing applies. God wants you to have every area of your life met. And and, and, uh, there's there's a simple biblical pattern that Pastor Paul does a brilliant job of highlighting in this book. And he talks about stewarding, which is tithing, giving the first fruits. And we talked about that last week. And then he talks about seeding. And seeding is about legacy. Seeding is about us thinking about our future and creating a generational echo. In other words, the tithe is about gratitude for what God has given us. Seeding is about thinking about our future in the context of the church and how can we sow today for a better tomorrow. We're thinking of our children's children. That's what seeding is all about. The farmer doesn't eat all his seed. No, he sows seed in order to have a future for tomorrow. The tithe is about what God has done. Thank you, Lord. And we give back to Him based upon what we've already received. But seeding, this legacy giving, is about us thinking about our future. But He's not only interested in the future of the church, He's interested in your future. And so you see right throughout the Bible, the discipline of saving. We would encourage every one of you to to be a saver. And and then as a result of us being human beings and and living in a very real world, we do need to spend. 
And, and this is God's way, but we've got to know that it's not enough just to have God's way. We've got to have God's order. Yeah. And Paul does it so well in this book. Talks about getting in the order right. So we tithe, we seed, we save, and then we spend. How many know, would it be fair to say, if you start with spending, guess what? If you start with spending, you may have every desire that you want to give. I, I do, I want to give. I go, but you know what? I, I will, I will give. I promise you I'll give, but I'm just going just to buy something first. Guess what? By the time it comes to saving, let alone seeding, let alone stewarding, there's never anything to give. And the biggest complaint to tithing and giving that I receive is I can't afford to. And those people who say that aren't lying. It's just that they've got to get their order in life again. They found themselves in bondage because we're not appropriating the ways of God. Are you with me? And so again, this book I would thoroughly recommend. And we can get them in the resource if we've sold out, but we'll make sure we've got plenty of those for you to have a read. And I want to say this. This is a new book. But Kath and I have been doing this for 25 years. I, I, I love Pastor Paul for many reasons. But when he put this book down uh, in print and I started hearing his teaching, I thought, wow, that, that's why I loved him because there was a kindred spirit. Some of the things that were in his heart were already in our heart yeah. Yeah. and, and as, as leaders. And I thank God my kids have embraced this way. You would have to talk really hard and really long to try and talk our kids out of this because this is all they know. And even then you'd be wasting your time. It, it's all they know. I'm so proud of Geordie. She's 21 years of age. She doesn't even have a full-time job. She, she works two jobs. She's got two part-time jobs. She's studying psychology at university. She's also doing a, a diploma in theology. She serves, she's serving on coffee today. Other times you see her up singing. And she believes in tithing. And she's done it for a long, long time. And I know right now she's praying about what she can give to legacy. But this young girl has saved an incredible deposit to buy a home. A deposit on a, on a part-time job is just, I won't mention the figure, but it's, it's, it's staggering to know what she saved. And if you know Jordy, she's a spender. You know, if, if there's a meal to be had and some friends to hang around with, she's there, I'll be there, yeah. She hasn't missed out. This works. It works. Are you with me? And so when it comes to all of this, legacy, as the band come up, that'd be great. 2019 and 2020, what's the direction for the next 12 months? And we, we take as leaders legacy very seriously. We sat down as a team and we wrote up on the board all the needs and there was 18 of them. That was us getting it down. We got it down to 18. And I thought, I am not presenting 18 things. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not presenting 18 things. I said, guys, someone's going to have to go without and honestly, what happened next is why I love doing what I do. The maturity in that room, the response in that room, the willingness to go without for the sake of what is needed. Now, all of the things on that list were needed. We didn't just make things up. Every one of them was a need. But people willingly to forego their need for the greater need. Ash, am I right? It's such a beautiful moment for me as a pastor. And I want to say church, as the leader, so the people. And so we thought long and hard, what, what is it that we can do in the next 12 months? And I don't know if you remember back to Heart for the House last year, we talked specifically about bringing a name change to Heart to the House, from Heart to the House to Legacy, because we wanted to think about our future. We wanted to set up our future generations for a win. And so we, we thought, you know what? Before we think of any of our present needs, we want to set our future up. And so we, we've made a commitment as a leadership team that 40% of what comes in, our legacy giving, is going to go to our future. We, we're thinking about how we can acquire future properties. I think about this property here. I think about the needs at West. And, and we want to be able to pull the trigger when opportunities arise. In order for us to do that, we need to make sure that we have a war chest, that we have a deposit, that we have a, 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 a nest egg to draw from in order to be able to say yes when opportunities come. 
And so where did that figure come from? Well, as best we could possibly feel in God, we think about you know, what, what a, a mortgage, uh, a deposit for a mortgage, an industrial mortgage would cost, and it's between 30 to 40%. And so if we could put 40% of whatever comes in aside, that means we will not get touched. And we put away into the opportunity for property in our future. That leaves 60%. And there's still, there's still 18 needs on the board. And, and we got those 18 things down. To our biggest need right now is families. And we thought, you know what? Of all the things we have to do, we want to prioritize families. What's going to benefit families in our church? And so the three big projects are all around making sure families are cared for and catered. And that would be the church family, but also it's going to benefit the community. And so the three areas, and we're going to get some team up on the stage next week to talk some, through some of these things. You notice in the uh, foyer out there, there's some posters up there with, with some of the more details of what I'm about to say. But the three areas when it comes to families, we want to revamp our kids' ministry. I said this to West, I said, there's not a lot in it for you personally or directly this year, West. But I want you to know for the last two years, Central has taken a hit so that we can get you up and running. And I, I would love for you to give wouldn't it be great for you now to give and central benefits because of what you're doing down there? And, and so we want to we revamp our kids' facilities. Our kids' facilities have been neglected and overlooked. Heart for the house campaign after heart for the house campaign because of other needs. Right now, I feel to put our kids' ministry and there's a list of things that we want to do. Electronic check-ins uh, is one of the big ones we want to just add. And there'll be just revamps to the, you know, all the kind of kids' areas and ministries there. The second one is the cafe. Uh, we, we've started that. We're just, we're just doing a little bit of a spruce up before the 25th, but the, there's a whole heap of work we want to do into the cafe beyond that. Uh, again, it's, it's a hub for us. We want to create an environment for families to stay. Church isn't just this. Church for me is as much what takes place when the final amen is said. And so I would encourage you, when, when you, when you allocate time for church on a Sunday, don't just think, when does the service finish? Add an hour to that time. And hang, because there's gifts, there's talents, there's wisdom, there's stories, there's testimonies in you that people need to hear. There's parenting advice that some of our young people, they, they, they need, they need to hear from you. And, and so we want to create the most warm, welcoming place. And this I know, we live in a world that's full of Westfield shopping centres. In Westfield, and, and Moggy would know this to be true, and others who have worked in retail would know this to be true, that... Uh, you have to change your shop frontage every five years in order to keep it modern and fresh. And I thank God for this building, but we've been here 10 years. And I thank God for the understanding and the generosity of this church that we've been able to do different things to this building over the years. Thank God it, it doesn't still look like it did when we first moved in. When we first moved in this building, the very first service, there was no carpet. There was no heating. We had beanies and we had, it was just... I'm glad, we've, I'm glad we've moved on from, from that. But you know what? Whatever we do needs, you know, this is a public place. And there's kids. I mean, Lee was just telling me just the other day, there was some young girl with some roller skates on who thought it'd be great because she saw a bug on our newly painted walls and she put a skate up to squash the bug. Now, we love all people, we do, and we, we love kids. But they're the realities. And we actually allocate a budget to youth ministry for fixing holes in the walls. <laughs> so that shouldn't happen, those young people. Yeah. Your answer's in your statement, those young people. What were you like when you were young? It's naive to say, oh, it's just a reality. It's just a reality. And so we, we want to we wanna put uh, some, some money into our cafe. And the other is finish off our outdoor area. As part of our kids' renovation, we're looking at getting rid of the indoor playground. And we're looking at getting a playground for outside. We've allocated a space for that. We also want to put some sails up there. We want to put a basketball court out here. Again, that's going to benefit the church, but it's also going to benefit community. I love what takes place on Saturday, but, uh, on Sunday, but you need to know what takes place midweek. What Dan and Ashari and the youth team are doing with our young people is amazing. Do you know 40% of all those that come to youth don't even go to this church, they're from the community? I mean, that's worthy of a round of applause. I mean, it's crazy. So good. 
I don't know if you know this, but Barry and Bronwyn Clare lead a group of older people and that is just growing. They meet every Thursday and they're just doing incredible things. I thank God for that. Megan Lyons is looking after playgroup and every week we go and they say, who is this now? There's all these new people and the people don't even go to church. It's amazing. And I think, man, if we're going to pour money into our future, if we're going to pour money into seeing the church grow, we just really feel from God to prioritise families. Uh, and I would rather highlight those three things and do them really well and then get so much money and we can do all those other things as well. Other than say, here's the 18 things you want to do and only be able to do one. I- I'm believing we can do this and more. I really am. And uh, next week, I'm really looking forward to, I'll be joined up on stage here with a few of our team and, and we'll just talk through some of these things. We're going to talk through some of the things that um, we've talked about doing that haven't yet happened and why uh, and all those kinds of things. So would you stand with me this morning? Oh,